Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and this is my roundup of the 31 new to me games I played in July. So if you missed it, I've been going through a game a day challenge this past year. I've been trying to play a new game every single day for, well, the entire year. A new game meaning a game that is new to me, although I do include some things you might not want to count, from expansions to occasionally even digital games. I think I have one digital game in this list today, or I think that's the extent of the cheating I have. But either way, a new game to me, and I'll be going through this as usual. Now, at the end of every quarter, I do a full roundup and ranking, so I'm not going to go into all 20, all 31 of the games I played in July. Uh, rather, I'll briefly go over 20 of them of just telling you, hey, I played these 20 games, these are the 20 games. If you have any questions, by all means, ask away. Half of these were reviews, the other half not so much. And then the other, the other 11, I'll be going into a bit more detail. 11 games that I wanted to talk to you a bit more about my experiences with those games, but we'll save and timestamp those for the end. So starting off with those 20, starting off with the 20 games that I'm not going to heavily go into detail on, uh, just in no particular order other than the order I just marked them down as I play them, we have Legends of Hellas, a small little pocket-sized game that is okay. We have Steel Coliseum, a game I had a chance to play online on TTS during the Kickstarter. It's a robot arena combat system. It's good, didn't amaze me, but it was good. Uh, we have First in Flight from Genius Games. They did a Kickstarter of First in Flight, a deck building, push your luck, action selection system. I uh, really enjoyed that one. A little on the repetitive side in the gameplay, but I really enjoyed the puzzle it provided and looking forward to getting that one. We have Dinosaur Island Roar and Write, a game that I consistently think I'm wrong about because every time I talk about it, I get corrected about the fact that you don't actually have your park overwhelmed by bad things happening. But I had my park overwhelmed by bad things happening multiple times that I played it. I did tend to go carnivore, but... um. Anyways, uh, that's Dinosaur Island Roar Right. We have Brett Wilder. Brett Wilder is one that I briefly got a chance to play. Briefly, 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 meaning I had a prototype. I uh, got a chance to start diving into it. Did not actually get into the game properly. Had too many issues in the way of me playing it. So I do not have an opinion on Brett Wilder. But I did sit down and give it like three hours of my life. And so I, I am counting that as a play on my, on my books over here. We have Wormholes. Wormholes from AEG, which is... A, a game, wormholes, a game, it's a game, but trying to create wormholes as you jump through space, trying to be as efficient as possible in a game that's around half an hour, and in my opinion, a little too short for the experience it gives. We have Minecraft Builders and Biomes, which is an older game that gives you a Minecraft theme. My kids like Minecraft, my kids like board games. I sat down and played Minecraft Builders and Biomes with them. Liked it more than I thought I would. I uh, really enjoyed it. Still still here on the shelf, keeping around that one. We have Prehistories. Prehistories, another family-based polyomino game. Uh, enjoyed that one. Definitely on the lighter side. Definitely an intro to polyominoes, but a fun game. We have Making Manhattan, another button-shy wallet game. Uh, I don't know why I said another. To me, in my head, it's another, but I didn't talk about any button-shy games today. But we have Making Manhattan, which is a button-shy wallet game that uh, gives you a bit of a point-scoring system as you try to be mindful of Central Park and then the various sections of the city, each reflecting each other as you score. It's good, but I prefer other button-shy games that give you similar scoring patterns. We have ben Bandito, a small a small box game from, I always forget the name of the company, Helvetique. Uh, Bandito from Helvetique, which gives you a escaping from prison kind of a uh, game, or it's actually Bandi, no, Bandido, Bandido, I already played Bandida, this is me playing Bandido for the first time, uh, escaping from prison with, as you lay down cars in a cooperative game, fun, simple, very, very light, but uh, surprisingly fun for like a good party adjacent game. We have Empire's End from Dan John D. Clare, uh, that's a prototype I played at Origins, uh, but Empire's End is a solid game that, or at least my one play of it was solid, my biggest concern is does it hold up to multiple plays, but I did very much enjoy what I had with it so far. We have Knight of the Ninja, another game I played at Origins. Uh, Knight of the Ninja is a, a social deduction game with a degree of, of bluffing and double think and double play and all that. It gives you a decent party slash hidden identity game that works fairly well. Uh, overall, a compelling and enjoyable experience. I don't think it's an amazing game, but I had a lot of fun playing it every single time I played it. We have Brew from Pandasaurus Games, which is... Very, very good, but a little bit too much uh, a control for the person who goes last each round, to the point that that kind of ruined the game for me. I like the game a lot, lots of scores, excellent game, but a little bit too much control for the last player, to the point that we thought that was the most important thing you can do the entire game, is try to be last player in the round. We have Tidal Blaze Banner Festival. <clears throat> Tidal Blaze Banner Festival, a game that gives you trick-taking, but trick-taking where you don't really care if you win, lose, or go in the middle, which isn't really fair. You do care. They each give you different things, but it's not about winning is inherently good. It's about winning is one of the things you can do. Uh, overall, I enjoyed it, but I found it a little bit too loose in the fact that you always get something, and it was a little bit less compelling to always try to win at the right time, and the very nature of the puzzle didn't always let you have amazing moves as you ran around the track. It was all situational. Good game, pretty decent, but I prefer other trick-taking games. We have Whirling Witchcraft from AEG, a game that 
gives you a bit of a trying to blow up the pot on the person to your right. You're trying to blow up someone else's pot. So think ruling witchcraft, but think Quacks of Quedlinburg, but instead of your own pot blowing up, it's somebody else's as you try to create a little bit of a tableau of swapping things in and out and creating a little engine of various conversions that hurt your opponent. Uh, I like it. Very much a party game as opposed to anything else, especially because of the fact that you can lose or win because of other players and nothing to do with how well you played. But overall, really enjoyed it. A solid party game is the way I would look at it. We have Isle of Trains. Isle of Trains, which is a reprinting... A re-implementation of the original Isle of Trains. I think this is called Isle of Trains All Aboard. And this one is a little tableau building game with multi-use cards. Very compelling, very simple, very, very solid, but also gives me a little bit too much stuff to look at to the point that I kind of have to either just play the game or play the game optimally and have it drag forever, which isn't my preference either. We have Stars of Akarios. Stars of Akarios, which I got a chance to play a few times. I really need to dive back into it, but I also need to read the rule book before I dive back into it. And the rule book's not, not... Not short at all, but Scar Stars of Akarius, uh, definitely a solid first impressions from when I first started diving into it. I need to give it a lot more plays before I have an official review of it, but I really enjoyed Stars of Akarius so far. We have Tsuro. Tsuro, which I believe I played for the first time ever. Like, I don't think I've ever played Tsuro, but I don't know if I haven't because... Like, I kind of knew how to play, but I don't think I've actually played it. But Tsuro is a game that I have Indigo. Indigo is my preferred version. Because they have the active Kickstarter, I dove into Tsuro to just try it out. And it was good. I prefer Indigo. We have uh, Kuperium. K or Kyperium. Ky I think it's called pronounced Kyperium. Kyperium, a game, a prototype that will be coming to Kickstarter at some point that I had a chance to play. It's primarily a two-player head-to-head -head experience that as you play cards for yourself, you're giving your opponent worker placement zones. But if you time it right, you can also remove those worker placement zones, uh, which will help you out because you don't want them to have good worker placement zones. An interesting puzzle, need to play it more, I only had one play of it so far, and that's Kyperium. And then lastly, before we get into the uh, actual games that I want to talk about a bit more in detail, we have Trust No Bunny. Trust No Bunny is from the designer of Mechs vs. Minions, and it is not a physical game. It is a digital implementation game of a Think One Night Ultimate World, Think The Resistance, it's that style of game, but specifically on Steam and on Steam only. It's giving you that type of game where you have these bunnies that are secretly trying to betray you, and bunnies that are working in your favor, and different uh, mechanisms as far as choosing the team, and working with the team, and then having different powers and abilities. A very interesting puzzle. Uh, to me, it's not that much different in feeling than playing Resistance when I play Werewolf. It's that genre. If you like that genre, you'll probably like that game. With the caveat that this is digital only, which has me a whole lot less interested. To be frank, I played it because the designer of Mechs vs. Minions, one of my favorite games, asked me to play it. If not for that, I, I probably wouldn't have played it. And that is everything we have as far as... That's everything we have as far as wards. As far as the 20 games that I'm not heavily going into detail on. Which brings us to the 11 that I'll go into a drop more detail on, starting off with Wild Serengeti. Wild Serengeti from Bad Comic Games is a game that disappointed me to a large degree because I really thought I'd like it. It had, it had a lot of puzzling mechanisms, it had a lot of, of rave reviews uh, doing the Kickstarter, rave covers doing the Kickstarter, talking about how good it was, and I, I thought I would enjoy it more. And then I played it, and it wasn't bad but it left me really not that compelled. In terms of games that give you a point scoring mechanism, in terms of games that give you, hey, try to arrange things in different ways for different scoring patterns, with different cards, different things, different things you're trying to do, there are many games that do this well. To me, Cascade is going to be one of the best ones that does this, but there are many, many games that have degrees of different point scoring combinations. Wild Serengeti felt like it was trying to do that, but ultimately didn't, at least not well, not for me. It was an okay game that didn't, really work as far as the type of experience I was looking for from it. It was fine, but it wasn't... Like, the way I put it is, when I rate my games, uh, one of the most common ratings I have is a 3.5. One of the most common ratings I have. And the reason for that is a 3.5, where I grade that as, is a 3 is a good game, but I just don't care if I never play it again. A 4 is already moving into games that are, you know, better that I really want, and anything above that, anything a 4 above is already very good. And a 3.5 is that middle line of, I liked it, but, and I'll miss parts of it if I never play it again, but I can't keep or play all the games, and so it has to go. And sometimes 3.5 stay, longer conversation about the nature of what I keep and leave. But 3.5 is often a game that if I never play it again, I'll be fine, but I will miss aspects of it. Wild Star is a 3 for me. It was a good game, but I will not miss any part of it again. There's not a single part of me that's like, you know what? Maybe I wish I had more time to play Wild Star I don't. It disappoints me. We have Tyrants of the Underdark. Tyrants of the Underdark, which was a game that I really liked. I would give that one a 4. That was a really solid game that I thoroughly enjoyed. Tyrants of the Underdark is an excellent uh, deck-building experience of area control that had garbage components and not enough card variety between the different cards you can use for me to feel strongly about the replay aspect. I dove into it, dove into it a few times. I enjoyed it a lot, but I also... If it had better components, I think I would keep it. Or, if it had more more variety between the decks, meaning 
In the game has a system where you use the core deck and you use, you use the core cards and then two other decks mixed together. And I think that the core concept of the way the game works in generating power and generating uh, resources to buy stuff and not a ton of variety past that made it so that I feel that using any two decks had a slight flavor adjustment, but not a very heavy flavor adjustment. And I wanted more in terms of the flavor adjustment. I wanted more in terms of feeling like the reason to pick a different deck or to try the game again or to continue to dive into it felt more different. I like Tyrants of the Dark a lot. Again, I give it a four. Fours are games that I don't often get rid of. In the case of Tyrants of the Dark, it's a four that I, I do think I'm getting rid of because of the fact that there are other games that give me a deck building experience a little better than Tyrants of the Dark did. I really enjoyed it though, very solid. We have It's a Wonderful World expansion, or It's a Wonderful World specifically diving into this with, um, what's the expansion called? I don't remember. Corruption and Ascension? Corruption and Ascension, I think that's the one. It's a Wonderful World, Corruption and Ascension, which is the expansion to It's a Wonderful World, and I dove back into What's a Wonderful World with the Corruption and Ascension expansion. And I very much liked It's a Wonderful World more with those cards. It gave you an extra degree of variety, it gives you like three paragraphs of rules, you can learn the game in two seconds, but it gives you an extra... It gives you extra stuff to be mindful of as you play the game, extra cards that combo off of sets of things of different colors or different types of tokens you have, and it gives you these cards that give you a penalty to your production, which also works nicely, especially if especially if you're not even going for that production, so the penalty is kind of fictional, not really, really real. Uh, overall, I very much enjoyed it, but I find that It's a Wonderful World, and It's a Wonderful World, Corruption and Ascension, and It's a Wonderful World, or What's Wonderful Kingdoms, I find all those games at the end of the day, I tend to enjoy the end result of the puzzle I built, but the process I find not that interesting. It reminds me of Red Rising. Red Rising from Stone Mario Games is another game where I always enjoy the end game of Red Rising. When I have to sit there and I'm at the end of the game and I'm looking at the thing I built, and the combination of cards that I have, and how many points I scored, it is always incredibly satisfying. But up until that point, I don't find the gameplay to be that compelling. I find the end result to be compelling, and that's true of It's a Wonderful World as well. It's a good game. I wouldn't turn it down. And I think I do like it more than Red Rising. But ultimately, it's still not one that I'm overly... It's still not one that I overly feel the need for. Then we have Moonraker's Luminor. And I'm showing you Moonraker's because if I showed you Luminor, I'd have to show you my laptop, and that's just less cool looking. Moonraker's Luminor is the uh, digital version of Moonraker's, giving you a solo or cooperative experience of Moonraker's, using your existing content that you have, whether you have expansions, base game, promo packs, you can check all that stuff off, and then it gives you that digital implementation aspect. I don't know when this video goes up, and the campaign for Moonraker's may or may not still be active, I don't know, you can check that out, just Google Moonraker's on Kickstarter. If not, I'm sure there'll be a late pledge available at some point. But Luminor is, Luminor is, here's, here's my, my history with Luminor is as follows. I played Moonrakers, and I enjoyed Moonrakers, but then I played it more, and I enjoyed it less. Then I played it with the expansions, and I enjoyed it more. But after playing with the expansions, I told Austin, Austin from IV Games, I told him, I said, hey, these expansions really brought Moonrakers back up for me. But I wish you could play the game cooperatively. I said, at the end of the day, I really like it. It's back to where it was before, but it kind of makes me just feel like I want to play this game cooperatively because I feel like we're working together the whole time. And then we get to the end game and someone has to backstab somebody else to pull ahead, which is okay. It's fun, but I, I just kind of wish we were working together the whole time. But obviously, you need a challenge in, if that's going to happen. You need something against you to that happen. And Austin's like, well, funny you say that because we have a cooperative version of Moonrakers coming out in the shape of this digital hybrid adaptation. And I liked it. I have to play it cooperatively. I still only still only played it solo, and I really want to play it cooperatively. But I think Moonrakers Luminor is mostly going to be my go-to way to play Moonrakers, or at least my preferred way to play Moonrakers. Because again, I really like what the expansions did for Moonrakers, but I prefer. I want to feel like we're working together the whole time and not just for most of the game. Then we have Scout. Scout is a game that I also played at Origins. We have a whole bunch of Origins games that I played here because, well, just because. Uh, but Scout is a game I played at Origins that is a. Uh, what's the name of the company? An Oink game. Oink games are those little small little box games, and Scout was one that I... I played a few of them. None of them have actually stuck their way into my collection just yet, and Scout might be the first to do so. I don't have a copy yet. I hope to get a copy. But Scout was an interesting little puzzle mechanism of trying to play cards down in patterns and then beat people's patterns, but also taking cards down. And the interesting part about Scout is you can't rearrange your hand, which resulted in this interesting puzzle of the order you play things would lead to different combinations or different lengths or largestness of sets that you could play that was very intriguing and very interesting and was very fun. I only got to play it once, as with many of these games, or half the games I only played once, but Scout was one that I, I very much enjoyed and want to play that one again. Then we have Rove, or more specifically Rove Expansions. The expansions to... Wait, no, that's the wrong Rove. Oh, interesting. 
Interesting, even better. Then we have Rove. This is the problem with writing notes. I am only just realizing as I'm going through this that I wrote down Rove and my list, and I didn't write down Rove with expansions. The problem is Rove is not a new game to me. Rove with expansions might be. So what am I talking about when I say Rove? And the answer is I played Rove. Not Rove, the small little button shy game from Button Shy. Rather, I played Rove, the giant big box game that will be coming to you from the creator of Gloomhaven Crimson Scales. That's correct, Gloomhaven Crimson Scales. Uh, but Gloom Gloomhaven Crimson Scales is the fan made expansion to Gloomhaven. The creator of that, Addicts Games, they're making a game called Rove that will be coming to Kickstarter, I believe, September. We'll see. Uh, but I had a chance to finally dive into Rove. I had a chance to play. I played. Crim I, I already played Crimson Scales a while ago, but I had a chance to dive into. Did I mark down Crimson Scales? I may not have marked down Crimson Scales on my list of games I played. I'll have, to, I'll have to go fix that if I didn't. But I played Rove. I played Rove um, with the creator online on TTS. Uh, went through the game. I want to play it more, but I really enjoyed my first play of it. Rove is a game that very much captures a lot of the feeling of Gloomhaven. In some ways, it improves upon it, which we'll get into more when we cover the game, because I will be covering the game. But in some ways, I prefer Gloomhaven. I need to play Rove a whole lot more to see where I prefer Rove, because the one thing I definitely have not experienced at all yet in Rove is the character leveling up. Is that degree of gaining experience, upgrading your character, growing and developing within the system. But I'm very much looking forward to Rove. If you like Gloomhaven, you absolutely should be paying attention to Rove. Whether or not Rove is a game that works for you is a different story, but it has enough common DNA that it's a game you should be paying attention to. Then we have Blood on the Clock Tower, speaking of more Origins games. Blood on the Clock Tower is a game that I played and did not enjoy. Now, if you watched my video on it, then, um, well, you know how I feel about the game, but the video was more about my general overall experience of things that are and are not related to Blood on the Clock Tower itself. That said, the reason I want to talk about Blood in the Clock Tower right now is because Blood in the Clock Tower is still a game I have no interest in playing. I acknowledge and respect the fact that there are many different external circumstances that led to me not enjoying my play of Blood in the Clock Tower. That's something I made clear in the video that I did talking about it. But a lot of people were like, but you should, you should give another chance in the optimal situation, optimal scenario. And I get where you're coming from. I really do. Like, I very much get it. Again, I remember one of my first videos on this channel was me responding to Tom Vassell uh, in a video. Tom Vassell, Dice Tower, put out a video saying why uh, first impressions of Food Chain Magnet and why it didn't work for him and why he didn't like it. And I put out a response video to that saying like, hey, I think you got all these things situationally wrong that struck you against the game. I'm not saying you should try the game. I'm just saying I think there were factors here that possibly ruined your experience of it. And that's true of Blood on the Clock Tower. And I recognize that's true. That's not a question at all. I 100% recognize that there are many external factors to Blood on the Clock Tower that make it so that I am less likely to have enjoyed my experience of it that's not necessarily against the game. At the same time, nothing I saw about the game made me think that it's the kind of game I want to try to find another experience with. Could it have been a better experience? Absolutely. Is it possibly an amazing game? Absolutely. Did I get the sense from my experience that there was anything that I was missing out on? Not particularly. I think the things, the way I'd put Blood on the Clock Tower, and it's, it's possible that it'd be the best game ever. It's possible I would love it. But without knowing that, just using my own projection of my own things that I like and don't like, I think that my experience, in terms of if this is a neutral experience and this is a positive experience, this is a negative experience, my experience playing Blood on the Clock Tower was down here. But if you remove all the external factors, I think it's just a game that I'd be okay with. I don't think it's the kind of social deduction game that I am as interested in. In general, I don't think it's the kind of social deduction game that I'd be as interested in. So Blood on the Clock Tower still remains a game that if I ever play it again, it's because there was a darn good reason to, whether someone paying me or whether... I don't know. There'd have to be a darn good reason to, to play Blood on the Clock Tower again. I just wasn't compelled enough by the game. Then we have Cloudspire, another Origins game. We're getting a whole lot of Origins games. Again, it's just the nature of going through those titles. Uh, but Origins, uh, Cl Cloudspire was a game that I played at Origins for the first time. I had Shipper 3 games teach it to me, uh, and then went home and proceeded to play it solo. And I have really been enjoying Cloudspire a lot. A lot, a lot. I've talked about it a lot. In fact, I've talked about it more than I've played it at this point. I've played it a few times, but I've, I've talked about it a whole lot more. I really need to spend time diving back into it, because I need to get up and prepped and ready, because I, I believe... I believe I'll be playing it cooperatively soon as well. Uh, I believe Meg, Professor Meg's coming in from out of town, and uh, we have on our agenda to actually finally play Cloudspire. Hopefully, maybe, we'll see if that actually happens. But I really enjoyed Cloudspire. It was a fantastic experience, and it's... I'm really looking forward to continuing to dive into it. I'm looking forward to learning the factions. I have all the content for it. I hope they continue to put out more content for it. Not that I need more content for it, but Cloudspire is the first Chip 3 Games game I've played in a long time that I think has the potential to overtake Too Many Bones. Purely potential. 
potential does not mean it will. Keep in mind, once upon a time, I said Ankh had the potential to beat Blood Rage. Further plays of Ankh later, and Ankh is fine, but Blood Rage is still better. At least for me, this is all my own opinion. And that might happen with Too Many Bones and Cloudspire too. It might be that 10 plays into Cloudspire, I'm like, you know what, it's great, but Too Many Bones is still, still better. That's entirely possible. But for the first time, I see the potential of a Chip Theory Games beating my favorite Chip Theory Games, and that's Cloudspire. Then we have Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea, Spies, Lies, and Disguise. This is a game from Arcane Wonders that gives you the Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea experience, but with a three new theaters of war. Heroes of Land, Air, and Sea is a two-player head-to-head game of 18 cards of trying to outplay, outmaneuver your opponents. I really enjoy it. I think it's an incredible game. It's one of those. It's one of the first reviews I ever did on the channel. It was a game before I even did reviews. I played it and enjoyed it so much, I was like, people have to know about this game. Way back in the day, I did a review of Heroes of Lair, Land, and Sea. Again, it might be the first review. I did a comparison of uh, Cthulhu That May Die and Zombicide Black Plague, but it's possible my first review is Heroes of Air, Land, and Sea, and Heroes of Air, Land, and Sea, Spies, Lies, and Disguise is just as good. It's three new theaters of combat, but the gameplay is just as good. I really thoroughly enjoy it. We have Zombicide Rolling Right. Zombicide Rolling Right over here, which is a game that let me down, although I don't think it's necessarily the game's fault. Zombicide Rolling Right, or Zombicide Gear Up as it's called, is a totally fine game. Totally fine. I thought it was totally fine. That, that's where it is. Uh, for me, Zombicide Gear Up gives you a polyomino cooperative roll and write experience. And while I like polyominoes and I like cooperative and I like roll and writes, the one thing I have found that I have, the one thing I have not yet found that I like is I have yet to play a cooperative roll and write that I enjoyed, or at least none that I can think of, he says as he scans the shelf looking for any. I don't think so. I don't think I've played a cooperative roll and write that I've enjoyed quite yet. And maybe that will happen at some point. Something about the nature of, of role my games and how they work and how they operate, I just haven't found it works well for a co-op of experience. The polyamino part is great. I enjoyed Zombicide Gear Up. I very much did. It was not a bad game at all. I enjoyed my time with it. It's great. It's totally fine. I'd rather play Cartographers. I'd rather play a competitive version of the same basic game. The same designer of this game, Zombicide Gear Up, is designed by the designer of Cartographers. And I'd rather play Cartographers, not because I think the core mechanics of Cartographers are better, but because I think the fact that it's competitive just makes the experience better for me. And then lastly, we have the Red Cathedral. The Red Cathedral, there'll be a full review of this one at some point, or maybe already. I don't really know the order of these things sometimes. But there'll be a full review of the Red Cathedral as well as the expansion. But the Red Cathedral is a solid game from Devere Games that I liked more than I thought I would. I, I knew about the Cathedral for the Red Cathedral for a while, and I never really heard mass praise for the game, so I kind of just let it sit on the back burner. But I'm happy I eventually got to try it because it is a fairly fast playing, competitive game that works well as far as the Euro mechanics around it, that is like deep enough to be interesting, but not so deep as to be overwhelming. And you can knock it out. A two player game of this can be knocked out in an hour, a three player game in maybe 75 minutes to 90 minutes tops. Uh, but it's a game that to me, I think it reminds me of Furnace. What is it rated as? It's rated as 80 minutes for the game. So that's not bad, I, I, I buy the 80 minutes. But it reminds me of Furnace in terms of the depth of the game, giving you a degree of competitiveness, a degree of, of engine building, a degree of trying to get your resources in play and a little bit of area control in the game, a little few things going on. But it's the weight class of Furnace and the game length of Furnace, and I think that the game length and accessibility is what might keep it in my collection for now. I don't yet know if it stays long term. I don't. I need a lot more plays before I say that. Right now it falls strongly into the category of I would never turn down a game of it. I think it's a lot of fun and I really enjoy it. Where I don't know yet is I don't know yet if it's the game that I pull off the shelf and ask, hey, can we play this? Again, using Furnace as a good base ben benchmark, Furnace is a game that I always am happy to play, but I've only asked to play it, I don't know, three times since I've gotten it. Uh, since, well, since I, when I first get a game, I usually dive into it, I learn it, I play it, but then after that, it goes into the shelf, and the question is, when does it enter the rotation? Furnace has been pulled off maybe two or three times since I reviewed it, which is not bad, but also not amazing, and the question is, what happens to the Red Cathedral? But I will say I very much enjoyed it. I'm looking forward to diving into it with the expansion, at which point there'll be a review as well. But that's it. These are the 31 games I've played in July. The 31, you know, games that count against my Game A Day Challenge. I'll be diving into August, well, soon, because that's the nature of this video series. But in any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I hope you have a good one.